I've been informed that the mobile phone is interfering with recording, so if you switch those off, please. And thank you all for coming tonight. Today it is my pleasure to introduce you to two contemporary free-thinking Swedish architects, Bolle Tam and Martin Wiedegård. These two architects endeavored in 1999 into setting up a practice, Tam and Wiedegård Architecture, in order to design everything from urban planning through to buildings, interiors, and objects. Today, they will discuss with us the cultural negotiations that they have come across and the art their talent has created. Since they began together, they have performed a tiptoe dance of architecture all over Sweden and sometimes across the globe. When it is about a hotel in the trees, it is lightly hovering in the forest setting, or if it is for their summer houses that they barely touch the Swedish ground in the archipelago, or their mirroring department store in planning in the middle of Uppsala. They always leave an impression. They sometimes shock the audience with their choice of colors in their public buildings or their interiors. As often as they calmly represented their clear forms in dark and modest statements into their stagings. Their choice of colors comes with a robust statement of a resolute and unshakable Nordic expression of clarity. The combination of color with their distinctive consent to steadfast geometries, to clarity of form, has given rise to the creation of, let us say, a new generation of architecture in Sweden. Their simplicity, their toe dance, stems out of their deep and extensive research methods, their search for innovations and logics in contemporary production. For their experimental practice of architecture, they have been awarded and nominated a whole range of best of prizes. Best wooden, best culture, best new, best of the year building, and further, the top two best young architects in the Nordic countries under 40, or now around 40. Their museum in Kalmar has been shortlisted for the Mies van der Rohe Award in 2009. The book Tam and Wiedegård Architecture came about in 2009 for the 10th anniversary, and the bookstore will have it in a few days at the AA. It is their reassurance of architecture, their standpoint of straightforwardness, their uniqueness, uniqueness, which we are looking forward to have them present to us here tonight in their lecture, Out of the Real. It is a pleasure to have you here, Chara Stockholmare. <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Bolle Tam and Martin Wiedegård. And uh, yes, we we, uh, we had to make a title for the lecture, and it's out of the real. We tried it on you, and uh, it sort of uh, embraces some of the interests that we have, uh, and uh, we'll see if that uh, goes through with the projects we're going to show you. Um, like Anne Sophie said, we uh, since the start we produced uh, or worked on quite a few projects and that is in part because we thought that architectural ideas um, need reality to, to be tested uh, in full. So um, when we set out, whether it was a big project and very often it was not, it was a small project, um, we thought it'd be very important that it got built uh, because that's when you can say as an architect that you have deliver the solution and also within the different constraints or um, accepting the situation as it is in reality. Um, there's, um, we're coming back to this, but there's two other things. There's, we, we often discuss context uh, in a wide sense of the word, um, meaning that, and linked to the idea of the real, that um, the context is what drives a specific project and uh, what helps us to, to make buildings um, relevant to their specific situation. Um, and that, that's a quite interesting discussion, of course, today as we are all part of an international uh, community or, and um, 
without um, without making an effort, you can you, you easily access all cultures and different expressions from around the world. And at the same time, you're based where you are, and uh, there's a saying that you you know you better dig where you are, and uh, that's also part of the relation to each specific context. But context could also be economy or history or social situations, um, the way families and uh, evolve today. Um, so those are reality or realizing buildings and uh, the context are two things. And, and uh, perhaps the third would be the way that we relate to built matter today and, and detailing contemporary buildings. Um, and, and this image, of course, has a lot of all of these aspects. It's kind of rooted, and, and you can feel the matter and the detailing. And a lot of those things just happened 100 years ago or 200 years ago. But today, it's something that we have to make a constant um, choice about. So um, back in 99 when we started, we felt that the architectural scene in Sweden and in especially Stockholm was kind of um, boring in a sense. Uh, uh, we felt a lack of inspiration and uh, we wanted some sort of um, different approach towards architecture. So um, that's probably the, the main reason why we started. And, and from that, and with the background of sort of boredom, we. we we uh, opted for some, some, some new stuff. And we felt that we, we had to sort of reinvent architecture to look back and uh, have a clean desk and build it up from, from the very beginning. And from that, it was kind of important to, to um, define what's, what's important and what's not, what makes a difference in architecture. And um, we, um, we have this picture as a reference point, which is a kind of pragmatic pragmatic approach, as Bolle was into. Um, it's, a, it's a, just a barn, a Swedish typical barn. That's, um, you don't build this one uh, because it's nice looking or, or it's a, a special uh, cultural context. It's more about economy, being efficient, uh, the way you do it uh, with local materials. And uh, from that, it sort of derives detailing and uh, and uh, perhaps some, some sort of decoration that's very, very closely linked to the, to the uh, structure itself. So the things that, um, that makes difference uh, that we felt were, were very close to scale. Um, it has to do with space, light, movement, those very basic things that sort of constitutes architecture. And um, you can find this in these very um, um, simple or, or old buildings in Sweden uh, and you can find it almost everywhere and uh, it's also a way of um, sort of taking away the the um, the um, how do you describe it the, um, the very specificness of the, of the time out of a building a look upon a building as just a structure uh, as space and what it what it sort of holds as a very classical in a very classical way of looking at it. Okay, <clears throat> we're we're going to show you <coughs> four or five or even six buildings. Uh, the first one is a museum in the southeastern part of Sweden, um, and this museum is uh, the city is called Kalmar. Uh, it used to be important for Swedish defense. Um, towards the Baltic and um, Germany and Denmark. And um, this is a very flat, it's a flat town. Uh, not a lot of topography where you get to look back at your own city. There's a few important buildings. The other one was the main church by the same architect who did the castle in Stockholm. And this is one of the oldest and most well-preserved Renaissance castles from dating from 1500. Um, and that's the church again, and the main square, uh, the castle, and the site uh, in between for this. It was a competition, an open competition, about 300 proposals. And one of the main issues was, of course, uh, how could you deal with this um, site? Uh, it happened to be the city park. 
and it also happened to have some of the remains of the old city wall. Um, and more, it had a modernist uh, restaurant pavilion, uh, a building that actually replaced another building um, in the late 30s. Everybody hated that bu this building at that point. They wanted to tear it down for 20 or 30 years. And then when, when this um, museum competition was launched and the idea from in the brief was that the museum would be uh, located just behind this restaurant pavilion so that you could use the restaurant for the museum. Uh, and then it turned out everybody loved this uh, restaurant pavilion in Kalmar. We looked at, um, at the site and um, this city park is characterized by its diversity uh, of species or different kinds of trees and also this kind of, well we, we call it an English planning uh, where you, the experience is that you sort of move around uh, and you're of course directed by different footpaths but you get different angles and it's about leisure and um, one of the first ideas when we saw this was that we, we would rather not take away uh, any possible connections within the park and as you can see, uh, this is representing the brief again, laid out across uh, the competition site. It would sort of um, divide this rather small park in a seaside and an inner side, which we thought was a pity. So we, we tried this instead, and also adding a new connection between the inside and the outside. If we look at the program, we, um, we could easily divide it into four almost equally squ big squares. And um, in the remembrance of the, of the kind of flat but um, uh, very high, uh, all the trees were very high and, uh, and um, the park is very flat, uh, we opted for this uh, vertical idea just to, to put the, all the program on top of each other. It uh, generated uh, different opportunities um, in the back or in the basement, uh, the ground floor. It's uh, the children's atelier close to the, uh, to the ground. Uh, one story up, the uh, contemporary exhibitions with uh, a view towards the water. Um, the vi video art and library, but also the, uh, the offices in a mezzanine level, and the top level, the museum's collection with the northern lights. So all those four levels uh, generated four platforms that could, uh, could give different qualities and different special ideas or qualities. So the walk in the park was uh, complemented by a vertical section, uh, which uh, offered, of course, uh, a new situation in, in this flat city. Um, this is just to show you uh, that one of the things we also looked at was how to organize the building in a very direct and simple way so that um, the exhibition spaces was, were um, liberated from <coughs> as much installations and technical um, details as possible. Uh, that was the, uh, the new entrance link between the two buildings, restaurant to the south, the, the stairs, the shaft, and the floors where you get the exhibitions. We, we usually describe this house as sort of um, new topo topography to the, to the park itself. Uh, the flatness got some um, verticality and new views facing the, the water and the castle and the city center. So this uh, stairwell is kind of important in the, the, uh, um, the vertical space that you move up and, up and down. Um, as you can see, the, um, the load-bearing structure, the in situ cast concrete is exposed in the inside. Uh, the exterior is clad in plywood and massive wood. It's all um, made it without any joints. It's just one massive block. And 
that's just to, well, what, one of the things that you have to work a lot with. We spend a lot of time on this, but it's not, not something that you see very much of in the, the building, except that you can, you can um, access the, the technology that you need. I mean, the main reason for, for the construction idea was uh, also that we knew that um, this museum had to comply with um, the highest international standards regarding security and climate and those kind of questions. So um, it made sense to have a heavy core, uh, so in this case concrete, and, uh, and then uh, we thought it interesting to provide different kinds of spaces so that there wouldn't be one ideal exhibition space, but a setup of different spaces. As it's a fairly small museum, you, you, uh, there's more, more or less four or five different spaces. This is the top floor, and this is uh, in the brief def defined as the where they should keep the collection, um, which is also why this is the only space where there is actually concrete in the um, exhibition space on the walls, because you, you don't rearrange that exhibition uh, so often. Whereas, if we go down further, uh, you will see that there are just white painted walls, more like uh, the, the uh, well, a straight, straightforward white box. And what you can say about this is like two things we did that weren't in the brief. Uh, for it said in the brief that you could build two levels in the park. And that was, of course, uh, in the mind of the, the author, uh, a, a way of sort of being. Um, taking care of the existing values in the park. Uh, and <coughs> as we showed before, we, 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 our analysis uh, showed that we thought that it was better to be very um, compact in plan and rather high, because you would still be between the big trees. The other thing was that the white box was defined as a space without any windows, or any daylight. And we also thought that you know if you're building in the city park, just next to the water, etc., it would be a pity not to have that opportunity. But um, from a technical point of view, it is actually a white box without any windows because when we did the calculations, we, we, uh, we showed how you could build a temporary wall in front of that window uh, and then you would you know, be able to um, meet all the most extreme requirements for regarding climate, etc. Well, this is a picture showing the facade. It's, um a sort of version of uh, Hesse de Meron's facade that you've seen. Um, they made it like 25 years before this one, but we added some sort of depth into it. Uh, as you can see, the shadow cast on this is um, creating a sort of three-dimensional effect, um, kind of similar to, to how the leaves sort of uh, play with the sun, um, but this is just an upscale version of it. One of the ideas of, of, of the exterior was also to let this fairly uh, massive building uh, in the park also be fragile or um, obtain a fragile moment. And these are not very important in detail, but what we show is that we tried to, to uh, make the glazing meet as far as possible towards the corners so that this solid block would also be very thin in some details. So you get di different impressions from just the um, entrance to the right. And this is where you can get an idea of the relation from outside the park into the white box and the thin corners. The, these kind of um, detailing those corners, how to deal with the windows meeting the corner, sort of um, uh, making the impression of a very thin and fragile box. It, um, it, it's kind of um, an ongoing thing um, for us, I think, uh, working with the, this very large scale, but still in the very small scale, uh, trying to avoid the scale in between, just to focus on the, uh, the very big impression, the, the whole building itself, and, but also keeping the detailing important. One of the things that is um interesting about that is also that if you, you can continue, um, if you have architecture that is, um, and I think these two projects, there's two small houses, summer houses, one summer house <coughs> and one private house, um, and there's a quality with the building that is really um, clear in its expression that we believe invites people also to create 
um, their own relation to a building. So, um, and that's all, all obviously double because it's not the same thing as being um, minimalistic or banal, but um, it's, it's sure that if something is clear enough, it's also easy for you as a, an observer to, to have an opinion or to, to create your own relation to the, to the space or to the object. Um, this project is a summer house that, that is very direct in its relation to the site. Um, and um, as in Sweden, as the, this is the Stockholm archipelago, um, there's, uh, there's wooden houses for many reasons. One is that there's no cars, so you can't access the site with the uh, heavy concrete uh, loaded <coughs> cars. But you have to come there with, with the, the building in pieces and carry the parts up to the site. So uh, we knew from the start that this had to be a light building uh, on a light construction. Um, and then as we realized, as you can tell from this plan, there's two boulders in, on the site. And at the same time, we had the south towards the bottom of the image and the sea and the, well, setting sun towards the left. So there was this kind of conflicting um, situation and directions. Uh, and there was one part of the ground that was flat. So we decided to place the building before we knew about what shape it would have, that we could use this flat part of the site so that we could eventually uh, imagine that the building would leave the site in 100 years and there would be no traces left of it. No boulders taken away, no sort of scars. So the um, the house itself for the insulated part is, is kind of um, this staggering um, contour that you can see. Um, but it's, um, Asamo is, is very much about being outside. Uh, as in Sweden it's very cold in the winter as you know, but uh, kind of nice in the summer. And those summer houses are mostly used in the summer. And um, then it's all about being outside and this is sort of a house um, trying to dissolve facing the sun and um, being a link between the inside and outside. So this uh, terrace which sort of um, closes the form and uh, defines the, the shape of the house is also a link between inside and outside but also this horizontal raster it diffuses the sun and uh, being a part of, of this uh, sort of um, sequence of um, from being inside to outside. But it's also, the terrace is also sort of a shortcut. Um, the sliding doors, if they're open, you're having the, the fastest shortcut um, from one room to another uh, is by going from through the terrace. So you move um, sort of naturally inside and out. Yeah, and one, one thing is of course, I think we can continue, but one thing is of course also that we can go for the front of there. That um, the, um, you have to sort of comply with the brief. And we, we didn't mention that before, but uh, I think that's, uh, that's also quite basic, of course. But in this case, uh, the client had a very clear view on what they, he wanted. Um, like a main building and an angle to protect the main building from the neighbor to the left. Uh, and um, as we realized that it wouldn't fit with the site, um, we proposed this instead, but they, so that in the end, they actually have, as Martin described, this wind-protected, staggered uh, outdoor terrace that is shielded from, from that neighbor to the left. Um, but it, of course, looks different from, from what uh, the client um, imagined. And uh, that is also part of the real stuff, I think, that. Um, the brief is not something, I mean, you can always question the brief and that's, uh, I think we all do that. But um, at the same time, it's a, lo it's a very good vehicle um, if you can sort of just embrace the brief and use it to, to create um, <coughs> the building or the space or the movement, or whatever it is that you focus on. So, uh, yeah, well, they built this uh, in 
during a winter on that cold island. And uh, it was finished um, four or five years ago. The next building is, um, is in a way very different, but also addresses its context and its site in a, um, within the same logic somehow. We call it the garden house uh, because the client moved from their apartment inside Stockholm to this site because they didn't, well, not because they wanted a house, but because they wanted a garden. Um, so it was all about the garden from the start and uh, we thought that was interesting and at the same time the, the site was kind of uh, difficult in a way uh, because as you can see here um, the right part of the site is, is very steep, you can tell from the curves uh, whereas the upper part is fairly small and uh, we realized um, a square building or a squarish building would, would sort of just leave a small path around as the garden but not very distinct spaces. Um, so finally we, we, we used the diagonal that was defined by, by the steep slope meeting that t flat part and, and then um, realized that, discovered that this triangular form would leave us with an upper part that is protected from the street which is down here and a, a fairly open entrance uh, garden part towards the street. So those two houses are kind of similar in that sense. It, it, they are both, the form is not, or the, the layout of the house is not generated by our will of doing sort of geometrical shapes. It's more a consequence of, of um, the site-specific circumstances. Um, then it's sort of closed in a, a very um, easy to read shape, but, but it sort of, um, <coughs> it, um, it solves many things at a time. And that, that is sort of an investigation of the specificness of the site. So as Bolle mentioned or uh, described, it's, this house is more um, three vertical gardens. Um, and the house itself is just an empty space. We define those three walls. Um, the triangular shape has no clear north face. So uh, all the sides could be sunlit. Uh, and, um, and um, it's nice to have this uh, sort of um, uh, idea of a house which is not, not as much of a building itself, more three gardens or three sites. Um, the position of on the site sort of um, generates a more open entrance garden and a one uh, uh, more intimate garden with a um, western light and an entrance site. Um, when you look into the house, you can have you can see this winter garden, which is the uh, the buffer zone for the air. Uh, the the fresh air comes through this winter garden, got preheated, and uh, then into the house itself. It's also a wooden structure, like like the summer house, and and it also sort of ends up with a an idea about how you relate to, to uh, the horizon. In, in the Archipelago house, uh, it was, the site was fantastic, so close to the water and, and, and to the setting sun. In this case, we realized that if you raised uh, the level six meters, you would actually be at the same level as the, the hill just nearby. And as you can see from the other side, there is the Lake Mälaren, which sort of leads connects the site into the center of Stockholm, that's the same water. And um, as you could tell from <laughs> those pictures, there's slowly growing uh, seven different parts, uh, uh, different species uh, that we decided together with the landscape architect to, to plan. These images, well, some of them were taken just after completion, so no, no greenery, and, and this is uh, after half a year or so. We have to go back uh, next year. One of the things that uh, I think we should mention also is that Martin and I, we, we always work together on all the projects. So we, 
sometimes describe the process in the office and I mean, if there's a method it's, it's more um, a conversation that sort of goes on about architecture and as Martin said, uh, you know, what, what makes a difference in architecture and for instance when, when you do museums, what is, what is exhibition space? Is there the exhibition space or are there several different um, environments that could be interesting when, when you work with art? So um, this is the new Museum of Modern Art. It's the first branch uh, in Malmö, which is in the southern part of Sweden. Uh, and the main museum is in Stockholm. It's a pretty formal building by Rafael Moneo. And we thought this would be an interesting um, situation and, and uh, a possibility to create something that adds and sort of complements the main museum rather than doing the same thing. Um, Here's a quick look at the map. Uh, Malmö. Uh, quite close to Copenhagen, we have this bridge uh, built a couple of years ago, which linked this into a uh, melt, more sort of a cultural melting pot in the south of Sweden. Uh, a lot of things changed due to the bridge, and um, it's the same when you work with a public building or a cultural building. Uh, things change uh, compared to housing projects, for instance. Those public buildings uh, generate a node in the city that um, it changes how people walk and um, um, the blocks nearby um, changes in many different ways. And just being aware of that, um, the awareness of it is important to have in mind. Uh, if you compare this project to, to um, Kalmar, it's kind of different because this um, is a, an existing building that we, that we had to start working with. A former electricity plant, kind of similar to Tate Modern, but much smaller, um, with a large turbine hall. Here's the site. And um, the possibility that we had uh, when it comes to extensions was a very small, narrow corner, uh, about 100 square meters. And um, from that, uh, we started figuring what could we add uh, to this sort of existing building that, that um, speaks uh, electricity plant from 100 years ago. So we felt that if, um, if you build as much as possible on this site and, and um, um, add an entrance, reception, shop, cafe, and perhaps an exhibition space as well, it would be a lot. I think that could also be put in relation to what you could use that space for, because it could have been the administration or it could have been just technical installations or something, uh, which was actually, during one part of the project, uh, an option. Um, you could also say that the, the, the original building had been altered already in the 50s, so maybe you could tell already from the drawings, facade drawings there, but the, that beautiful roof was taken away and a part of the low part of the building was also taken away. Um, the, um, as in Kalmar, the, the, the way that you access and move about in a museum is, is crucial. I think we had a benefit in both these projects that they are not, they're not huge museums, you know, so you don't have that well, German problem where you walk and you walk and, and you, get, you, know, you, you, you even lose yourself somewhere in the museum or you just get tired. Uh, and uh, so, I mean, that was not our contribution, but we, we realized that this was not a problem. So, on the other hand, it would be nice to be able to, to pick your own way and to offer several ways of moving about rather than just one. And what happened here was that uh, originally there was only one stair, actually. So you had to, you know, you had single access to all the spaces, then you had to go back and up the stairs or down the stairs. So we proposed this kind of possibility uh, and at that stage we also knew that we needed to div subdivide the, the turbine hall. The program told us that there should be a nice children's atelier uh, exhibition and um, to the far right the, the program actually said um, loading only. Uh, but we, we managed to convince the client that they could combine that because they are actually just loading and offloading you know, so many days a year, perhaps 5% of all the days. 
So the rest of the time, that space, which is actually beautiful, could be used for exhibitions. And uh, as you can also see, tell from this image, uh, the technical equipment was placed in the basement and these walls also um, helped us transport what we needed to, to uh, accommodate climate, etc. The, in a way, this building is much more problematic than, than the Kalmar Museum because the, that museum was uh, a totally new building. Uh, whereas here, we, we had to build a new building within the existing building to comply with the same standards. So, um, this project was, um, was in, um, had a really short deadline. We had like um, a year from start to go or inauguration. And um, so what we did here was to, to add this new entrance volume, uh, which also holds this new gallery, and those two um, um, walls, including the stairs. Uh, so very little in a way. And uh, at the same time, something that completely transformed the, the view on, on this part of the, of the city. Um, and these images, I, I think, yeah, they, they show um, sort of the other scale. If, if one scale of the project was relating to the Malmö and Copenhagen region, the other was uh, what you experience when you're very close to this building. So. Uh, Together with the, the city, we, we managed to convince them we could use uh, this fairly industrial material that would still be, you know, it's, it's bright orange, which alludes to, you, you may recognize the color from tools or um, trucks or something, but it also, of course, is in within the same, um, well, that word, uh, color uh, as the, the original brick buildings around the site. I mean, it could have been bright blue or something, that would have been very different. So um, that, that is also something that I think we, we try to pursue this um, detailing of a building within the industrial logics that we have to use today. Uh, and. Uh, trying to offer something that sort of can measure itself with how buildings were detailed many years ago. Or, I think we'll do a walkthrough. This um, extension also works as a, as a zone that you have to go through between the, the street and the exhibition space. And that's also one reason why why it's okay to use this bright color. Inside the exhibition spaces it would be hard, but here it's okay. It's the cafe and the entrance, and uh, it's kind of nice to have this color shock to, to pass, and then you're sort of into these white boxes that exposes uh, the art. So it's uh, also a way of um, dealing with this um, um, sort of, um, promenade. And uh, Anne Sophie, you mentioned color in your introduction, and there's another project or two, and I, we're not showing them tonight. But um, I mean, you could use color in many ways, and, and you can have different ideas about color. But I think we've, uh, as, as also for architectural form, we, we have been interested in looking at it as you know, if you didn't know so much, um, how would you use it then? Or if you didn't judge it from a cultural perspective. Um, and because m much of the way that we value color or architecture in general is, of course, very much based on what we know already. Um, and uh, so, well, that's, uh, that's also a reason to sort of be candid about the choice of colors and the, 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 the tool that color can be in, in architecture. There's not so much color here. Um, the, the main idea with the exhibition spaces here is that they would have more or less the same setup of, of uh, possibilities when it comes to lighting and you know for the curators to work the spaces. So, in these these images are from the opening exhibitions, and uh, then Luke Toymans in the big space picked a completely shadowless light, whereas here in, in the more intimate upper collection part, uh, there's much more a directed light and a totally different setting. Uh, 
but uh, well, the base are actually the same, so you could have that shadowless light or that directed light in, in all spaces. And in some parts of the building, like that one, you, you can also see a few remains of the original architecture, steel and columns. So it's um, the, the exhibition spaces are sort of um, generic spaces, just white boxes, but in different uh, sizes. Uh, the roof height here is 11 meters, and um, other parts are, are much more smaller. So it's a, it's a big, good mix between uh, long spaces, uh, narrow spaces, and tall and, and wide spaces. Well, the next project is um, the new School of Architecture uh, project that we um, are working on at the moment. Um, it's supposed to be finished in three years from now. And um, it's a result of a competition that we won uh, a couple of years ago. And um, it's been on hold for a while, but now it's uh, moving again. And uh, we're really happy with it. It's, um, it's, um, it's a totally new school. Um, the existing one is going. They go, the uh, students are going to leave that one, and uh, they're moving into this one. And it's um, a part of um, of uh, the um, KTH campus. Uh, KTH is the Royal School of Technology in Stockholm. So it holds a lot of houses and um, has a long tradition. And um, the most most of the houses are made in dark red brick, as you can see. And um, our starting point was to relate to that in one way or another. So we, we opted for this um, uh, Cortin steel facade, which is kind of similar in color. And um, uh, the facade also has a sort of um, resemblance to, to the masonry. And um, yeah, well, the campus is big. And one, one of the things that struck us when we looked at it was that, um, again, we were kind of uh, interested in how, how people used the different buildings, which was very much different from what we were, what we had experienced in the School of Architecture, where everything is collected in one building. So you would never leave the building, you would go to lectures or critics or ateliers or uh, the restaurant, etc. Everything was collected in one building. Whereas at the KTH campus, much more within the camp campus logic, uh, each building has a specific purpose. Uh, sometimes institu institutions share buildings, but mostly they have their own. So you're, you're more or less encouraged to, to move between buildings, and which means that the streets are, or the spaces in between buildings are, are used very much. So as you can see from this image we, we used, it's a, it's a fairly narrow situation. Uh, and um, this more or less triangular uh, courtyard between some of the oldest buildings um, holds the school, but the school also uses underground um, spaces to be able to still be, uh, let, let the original courtyard space be readable. There's another part of the project that we're not going into very much today, but it's linked to this building and it's the new campus entrance, so this new info center of uh, the uh, Royal Institute of Technology. And here we're looking at the uh, entrance floors that will hold uh, uh, ateliers and workshops. And it builds up. And uh, some, some of the things that we were, uh, that we are still working on with this building is uh, the way it, uh, First of all, the way it relates to the situation physically, but also uh, how, with a very specific architectural form, in this for case, a lot of curves, um, can you maintain uh, like a long-term um, generality or, or produce spaces that can be used in many ways, which is also in the brief. Act. You know, even, even if you know that the, the School of Architecture will use this building for perhaps 20 years or so, we hope longer, um, there's also the possibility of u different uses. So that's part of the project as well. Well, 
the, the program is kind of complicated because it, it's actually two, as Bolle said, uh, two programs. One is the info center, one is the school. And, um, and the benefit of, of um, having those two linked together is, is uh, the possibility of uh, the school uh, being able to grow into the other uh, adjacent house. So it, they, um, they are linked together on the ground. Um, so the, the, um, the contour of the house is sort of um, uh, generated by the, by the triangular shape of the, of the, of the site. And pretty much of the, of the um, ground floor level is also generated by this form. And, uh, and uh, when it comes to architectural school, um, we see the school or our sort of, um, remembrance of the school is, or is um, it's a sort of one-to-one -one scale reference. During your um, period in, in the school, you sort of refer to the school used as a tool to refer your own praise to. So we, we felt instead of um, uh, being uh, using the, the school as a tool of uh, understanding how to build the tectonic way of building, uh, we, we were more interested in, in how, to, how to deal with space and there is kind of fluent space that um, sort of links to another. To another. Um, complicated in a way, but, but still kind of interesting, and uh, it will take some time to learn, get to learn these kind of spaces. If we look at the ground floor, uh, we can quickly describe the program. All the common spaces are down here in the basement. It's a sort of subterranean level, so it's also the entrance level. Uh, but all the lecture halls, the meeting places, the workshops, it's down here. Uh, the workshop is um, located up here uh, with a sunken courtyard in the middle. One of the ideas um, that, that is still in the project is that everybody should access all floors in the building and even the roof. And uh, the courtyard that Mar Martin mentioned is also a possible link through the building so that you can access the building from different parts and walk through and connect. So. Um, a bit like in a city where you, when you know it well, you can find your shortcuts and, and parts or ways that, that you don't find if you're, if you're not sort of um, familiar with, with, with the structure. And we think that's okay. That also makes uh, it a place where you can feel at home even more, uh, but also at the same time uh, offering a, a clear enough structure. And as you could tell from the drawings, there's like, there's two main stairs. Uh, one, the first, is the, the one that you most often use if you're a visitor to the school. And the second is, um, again, more of a shortcut between, for instance, the, short, uh, the workshops or the ateliers and the upper floors. Well, this picture shows one of the ateliers. Um, we can see it um, has this uh, light, it's double height, so it has this <coughs> light coming from the uh, street level. It shows here also in the section. Yeah. I think we forgot to say that you, you must interrupt us with questions. It's too late now. No, but you're welcome. If, if uh, I mean, um, we can go back also if there's something you wonder about. So the mezzanine with, with some offices, administration, and these are the most uh, general floor plans. They, they come three times, and that's where all the students will be, more or less. And they are planned in a way so that you can subdivide them into different classrooms along the perimeter of the facade, uh, or keep them open. Um, and these are some studies we're doing currently, looking at um, the materials and um, what we're looking at right now is to, to leave all floors and the interior of the facade uh, as well as the, the staircases in concrete. It will be in situ cast concrete uh, while those glass walls have a metal structure and well you recognize the, the ceilings uh, that allows us to use both acoustic panels on top of it and, and also introducing air and that kind of technique without having to perforate all the ceilings. 
and then wood will be also material that comes sometimes in interior walls. Well, finally, the, the top level, which um, holds the, the space for the teachers and, um, and also have some, some uh, roof terraces uh, possible for everybody to, to access. And we're on, when you're on the roof, um, you actually have a look back at Stockholm, which is also interesting for a school of architecture. It, as it happens, uh, the, the, the School of Technology sits on a slope so that the higher up you get, you, well, you can always look back. As, as, as soon as you reach the top of the building, you can look back. Well, the final project we're going to show here is um, it's a very odd project. It's a tree hotel up in the far north of Sweden in Harads, a very small village like 300 people living there. And we got this phone call from, um, uh, from a person who has this small hotel up here. And uh, she wanted to build a couple of uh, uh, hotel rooms uh, located in, in the trees. And they asked like five officers to, to do their proposals. And um, um, we went for this one, this mirrored box. Um, it's very much about how to um, relate to, to this nature and um, the reason of going here. It's all about um, uh, exploring or experience the, the wild nature. Um, it's, um, it's a vast country um, with no people living here. Um, and um, and uh, it's cold at the moment, it's 40 degrees minus. Um, in the winter, it could be, in the summer, it could be kind of warm. Uh, so it's sort of ex extreme in a way. And um, we, uh, when we looked into how people or man relate to those extreme climates, uh, we saw that um, you bring a sort of high-techness uh, with you, like uh, Kevlar uh, or, or lightweight tents or um, uh, Gore-Tex clothes. Everything is very refined and uh, high-tech in a way. And uh, we felt that maybe that's an approach that we could use, sort of using this high-tech, meeting the nature. That's one part. The other part is, of course, how to deal with this nature that, that uh, shouldn't be cultivated. It should be kept as a sort of untouched, uh, pristine. And um, yeah. we, we found this mirror uh, uh, that, that's sort of a see-through mirror uh, when, you're, when you're standing on the dark side you can see through and um, so it sort of shifts between daytime and nighttime. <clears throat> These drawings just um, shows the basic principle of the aluminium frame, some insulation and uh, as you could tell from the illustrations before there's uh, plywood cladding in from the uh, interior and this mirror outside. Um, and what's very nice about this project is that it's um, coming back to what's real, uh, that it's, it's built by real people in this tiny, uh, it's not even a town, it's a, it's a village. Um, and uh, they, they managed to do it in a, an extremely well-crafted way. And of course also because they, they live very close to it, so they couldn't, you know, they had to um, deliver. And this is when it comes up. And it, it opened, this, well, this summer, half a year ago, or a little more. And, um, and it's now, uh, well, they, they are very busy. And it's, it's kind of fun because the, it, it used to be uh, this village with this small, um, it's not, uh, not, not an hotel, but a pensionat, as we say. It's, uh, you know, a few rooms along the, along the road between bigger cities and uh, you would eventually stop to have with your truck to have some Swedish meatballs or something. And, and now uh, they have sort of turned this into a place where people actually fly in from Italy or from, from the elsewhere.
Yeah. Well, it's, uh, it's a fairly simple construction in that sense. Uh, it's centered in the tree, and the tree is, works as a pillar. And it can hold like 15 tons. This one weighs about four tons. It's stabilized by thin wires, kind of hard to see, but uh, they are there. Uh, so it's a stable uh, construction in that way. Um, on the other hand, it's kind of light. Uh, well, um, it can move a little, uh, and it's it's um, it's not uh, you don't perforate the tree. It's as you can see, it's clamped around the tree, so you can um, loosen up those clamps if the tree grows. But we have picked a fully grown tree, so it grows extremely slow, and uh, it can also grow around those clamps. But um, um, it will, those kind of trees will be like uh, 30 meters high and then they sort of stop. Uh, and they are probably like 100 years old or more. Is that tree still healthy? Yeah. It's, uh, yeah. And, and uh, I, I, um, I, I think that those wires that uh, are connected to the tree, they actually stabilize um, the tree hotel so much that you, you really have to if you have a lot of friends and you start dancing, maybe it's sort of <laughs> moving a little bit, but, but uh, not if you're just walking around or, you know. Uh, and I think probably uh, wind in the tree is more uh, something that you would feel. Uh, so perhaps a bit like sleeping in a boat or something if it's moving. It's only four times four times four meters, so it's kind of a small hut yeah. centered up in the tree. Planning authority. Yeah. The, the nice mm. thing is that you don't need a building permission. <laughs> if, <laughs> if you're building in trees, it's it's a, it's a gap somehow. Yeah. Uh, but but then of course they talked, they they spoke to the planning authority, so they knew about the project. But um, there's a Swedish artist actually that, um, um, for more nostalgic reasons, uh, made a film about recreating a tree hut that he, I don't know, a memory he had or that he dreamt about that he had or something. Um, and uh, that was inspiration for the client in this case, I think. Uh, and and uh, he was the one that discovered that you don't need a building permission if you're building a tree hut. What's the name of the artist? Oh, that's... Uh, yeah, well... We, 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 should, we should know. <laughs> I'm embarrassed. I, well, the uh, film is called The Tre the Elskar. Yeah. You can find it. A tree lover. Yeah. <laughs> the tree hugger. So, um, well, here you can see how the um, this mirror mirror walls become visible or translucent during night time. Plumbing. The plumbing. Uh, there's. Uh, it, it's it's a bit like sleeping in a tent. So there's not a lot of plumbing. Uh, there, there's, uh, there's an electrical, uh, what's, what's it called? Uh, freezing toilet, something like that. Uh, and then there are facilities on the ground. Because there um, there's only one mirror box like this, but then there are a few others. Uh, and they share uh, well, a service building with a sauna and you know that kind of things. But it's... Um, um you have to think that um, the people coming here, they are, they are like uh, walking for two weeks in the mountains, sleeping in tents, and then they come here just for, for a night. So uh, they're kind of used to other sort of facilities and circumstances. And um, I think they want that as well. We haven't mentioned it before, but um, quite often when we, when we do those small summer houses, we have another reference, uh, maybe later down. Um, that sort of um, gives other qualities when it comes to uh, facilities that you want to be, that, that is not the, the common villa, the villa standard. Because uh, when you're in a summer house or, or a house like this, you want to be exposed to nature. You want to sort of um, be a part of it. So we have this small summer house that, uh, where every room is not linked uh, to each other from a central space because you have to go out to get into the other one. Um, so uh, it's kind of nice to, to work with these kind of um, uh, 
temporary buildings that you don't stay all the year round. I think that was the last, well this one is the last picture and hopefully you have a lot of questions. Um, I mean, you talked about experience and um, landscape and how buildings relate to the landscape and you, you spend a while talking on the image in the beginning about the old timber house and, and the basically yeah, what, what it was and, uh, and how it related and, and why it was built the way it was built. And I'm just wondering whether there is a, a missed opportunity, whether these images actually go beyond the images into experience, actually powerful experience of the landscape which is caused by the architecture. Um, and as an example, um, I would like to mention some of those timber houses which you can see uh, in Sweden and in Norway as well. And I mean, they're extraordinary how they relate to, 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 to nature. Uh, they've got very little openings and sometimes they've got this timber framed decoration in front of the opening almost as a screen to the wind and or even the view. So it's almost the cold and, and, and the sea uh, uh, ahead is something that actually you, s you slightly want to like you shelter from it, but you obviously acknowledge its presence. And whether if you just pin up an aquarium on top of a tree, whether actually this gives you any sensations uh, for the, I mean, more than, than actually, yeah, I mean, sleeping in a nice, well, comfy uh, room anywhere in the world or even on an airplane. So it's, yeah, it's, I'm, I'm not sure whether from an experience point of view, whether from a relationship point of view between, uh, yeah, the specificity of the landscape, where it really works. I mean, could you? The specific, well, are you, are you relating to? Well, if I sleep in this room upstairs in the front members room uh, and the view is Bedford Square, I mean, would it be different? You know, I mean, Bedford Square streets are always also quite nice. I, I mean, think, I think a building is always sort of carries the load or the, the um, quality of, of where, where, uh, where it is. So it's, I mean, so a very simple answer is, of course, that it's very different whether you're, you, if you have the same space in, in uh, Stockholm or in the north of Sweden or in London or somewhere else, it's, uh, it's a probably a very different experience. Um, I think you said something uh, interesting about, you know, the, the way that buildings, uh, um, you didn't say accept, but sort of uh, acknowledge uh, the nature or the landscape or the situation. I think that's, uh, that's a nice way of putting it because that's also where I think a lot of our way of relating to, um, well, both to cities and to nature uh, develops. And uh, an easy way to, to, s to illustrate it is, is if you look at uh, farms uh, close to some of the most beautiful parts of, of uh, Sweden, which is, for instance, uh, the co west coast or the island Gotland, which is in the Baltic Sea, uh, some of the best sites that you would sort of judge today that this is a wonderful place, this is where you want to sit and sort of just take in uh, nature, the surroundings, the sea, everything. Um, all those farms today are very closed off from, from the sea and from the views and from the surroundings. And it's, of course, because when they were built, the sea caused a problem, and it was mainly because it was a lot of cold wind, cold weather coming in that way, etc. So, but th that has changed. So, uh, the the protection aspect of of architecture is uh, today. It has to do with different things, and uh, we didn't talk very much about that today. But I think, uh, in certainly in the big buildings, in the big projects we're doing. Um, we've realized that uh, energy efficiency and all, all that part of architecture um, has 
sometimes to do with technological technology and that kind of solutions, but very often it's also about uh, just common sense. So you know, if you if you make a thick building, you have um, you have gained a lot. So, for instance, the school of architecture, the new school of architecture, is um, can use a lot of glazing. So, in a way, it's it's a very open building, but it's also a very deep building, and it benefits from that. So. Um, it, it's a com it's a complex question, and the to com coming back to this 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 uh, particular project, I think um, what we like about it is, of course, the double nature of it. That it's uh, it's both something that is really really strange for the site, but at the same time also some kind of a camouflaged uh, refuge, um, and it it's very simple actually. I mean, it's. Uh, so in a way, it also connects to that part of the tradition where you use you use the material that you have on the site and you just make a simple shelter. As I understood your question, it's a question about how to relate to contexts, and um, you can approach Kola's idea of fuck the context. Uh, but on the other hand, we were sort of um, framed within the country we come from and uh, and have a sort of cultural background. If you compare Sweden to, to Holland, Holland is a small country, a lot of people, 100% cultivated. Everything you see is made by man. In, if you come to Sweden, we're like um, one of the biggest countries in Europe. Still, we're only 9 million people. And half of the country is just woods and, uh, and hills. Um, so we, we uh, have a sort of natural way of dealing with nature or relate to nature. Um, in all our projects, I think. It, it's not about um, being romantic in a way, it's just the sort of circumstances that, that you have. Here, the, um, the, um, the starting point is the, the pristine nature. And uh, then it's about, um, uh, I think, qualities, how to sort of enhance qualities, define qualities, and what can we do, uh, have them as a starting point. Well, I think the, um, as we said, we had this um, high-tech approach towards the harsh climate. Uh, still, this mirror box sort of gives back uh, nature. It doesn't occupy. It, um, from a couple of views, it sort of um, blends into and becomes sort of a mirage or, or um, a camouflaged nest. Uh, but I, I also think that um, we're not only uh, local. Uh, here we're sort of, we have this uh, global knowledge, uh, we have the same references. We all look at uh, Arch Daily and the scene and read the same magazines. But still we, we, we can live in London or in Stockholm or, or in Harads up north in Sweden and, and those sort of local uh, circumstances and traditions and, and um, uh, so derives a, a, a different way of looking up upon things, I think. So um, this uh, uh, critical regionalism is kind of a nice way of, of looking upon uh, this both local and global uh, world we're living in at the moment. I'm particularly interested in the architecture school and in relation to the brief, uh, which you, and how you said at the beginning that uh, you analyze and try to uh, understand the brief as part of reality, as part of the context that you operate in. And I would like you to tell us a little bit more about uh, the brief uh, of the School of Architecture in uh, Stockholm. How is a brief of a School of Architecture set up uh, in those conditions and uh, what are the conditions of learning architecture, of establishing a discourse of architecture uh, and how did you uh, analyze and uh, discuss that uh, in your project? It's uh, <coughs> Well, first I think you could argue that the premises of the school is, is always less important than the way you organize the school or the teaching. And um, so, so in a way, um, and I, it's, it's also like, you know, when you look at uh, art spaces, if you ask artists which art spaces they would 
prefer? Which, where do they have their best exhibition space? It's uh, well from from the uh, from the statics I, I've learned. They they always ask uh, answer that it's a, a converted building. It's an old building that was not built for art or exhibiting art, but was converted into that. So, and I think that goes for this building as well. It's a very nice school of architecture, um, and. At the same time, so I mean, knowing all that, uh, I think what we have come to is that um, the building has to be very uh, open in the way that you could organize classes, different setups, you know, mixing uh, students and teachers if you prefer, or keeping them separate if you prefer, uh, etc. So there's no like locked order <coughs> except. The, the ground floor and the entrance floor, where um, the definition of the program was made uh, basically starting from what they had today, I think, uh, and then looking at the different possibilities or opportunities that will uh, arrive when they move the school. Because today, as I said before, they they have all the premises collected in one building, but it also means a lot of unused space because there's like huge lecture halls that are used twice a week or you know uh, whereas at the rest of the campus they you, you you book different halls and you can have a much bigger hall and you can have a much smaller one and you can uh, so it's a, like a condensed uh, school this time I would say um, and then well talking about the idea of you know why why rounded forms why curves um, there was two things First, when we studied that courtyard, uh, that was kind of limited in its size. Uh, we realized that when you when we rounded those corners, uh, you, you sort of made the visual impact uh, of the school um, less important. It was became shorter visually, and it also sort of, of course, um, encouraged movement around the school. Uh, and and from the interior, I, I think we also had this relation and this experience of the existing school that is very much divided in different spaces um, and that it would be interesting to have a less formal um, re relation between one space and the next, more like in a landscape where you sort of, you, you continue around the corner and there's another space except of open doors all the time. Yeah, you mentioned about um, well detailing in in the industri industrial production logic. Because of my study looking at Swedish uh, prefabricates, housing phenomena. And because I know you guys with another guys at our group called Architect Rules. Right. So I'm curious, can you talk more about these groups? Uh, what's the idea, what's the starting point of this group? And what is the production, what the, is the production process? Is that uh, do you have your own workshop or you outsource the design? And how do you utilize the factory if you outsource it? And what are the constraints we, uh, within this design process? In, yeah, well, first, uh, Architectus is the name of, uh, of the, uh, what do you say, of the enterprise or the company that sells these houses. So they're, they're simply our client, and then they called three or four architects to uh, design one or two or three houses each. So um, in a way, it's, uh, it's the same way that many buildings are produced, except that in this case, the idea is that they should be like, produced on, on mass. It hasn't really happened yet. To, uh, I think the very fight. simple starting point for, um, for the company was to, to sort of uh, trying to create uh, nice kit houses uh, for ordinary people with a small, uh, a small amount of money uh, or as much money as the general kit house. Uh, I think that was the very simple starting point for them. Uh, they're still struggling with the concept. Uh, uh, it's kind of hard for them to, to move forward, I think, uh, uh, for many, many different reasons. Yeah, as it turns out, uh, the, the combination of um, 
fairly small budget and a big interest of architecture is not as common as they thought, I think. So the market is, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're interested. <laughs> oh, no, sorry. <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, Try again. He started, he started a I lecture <laughs> saying that uh, uh, the architecture environment in, uh, in Sweden is boring, especially in Stockholm, and uh, um, I'm surrounded by those uh, Swedish, and they are laughing, and I'm just curious why, um, if that is the collective understanding of it's boring, why is it still boring? Mm -hmm. And, you know, if every Swedish think it's boring, why is it still that boring, and how do you try to be different? I think the, um, th th there's also benefits uh, of of the building industry in Sweden, or, or the, uh, the situation that we had after the Second World War, mm -hmm. uh, where, where Sweden was moving very strongly forward and, and they built a lot of public buildings and facilities, schools, swimming halls, all, all, all that kind of um, buildings, those buildings that sort of form society and uh, offer um, qualities for, for everyone, you know. Um, they were all built so that uh, in the end of the 60s or beginning of the 70s, um, I, I think one way of describing it is that first we, all, we had a lot of buildings already that were well functioning. Uh, and then also we had managed to sort of produce a system where um, the architect somehow had resigned from a lot of uh, influence in the process. Um, so, you know, if you, if you go back 50, 100, 100 years, th then you would have an architect um, that could influence a lot of other aspects than just form. And uh, so, to make it very simple, our view of, of the Swedish architecture scene was that the architect was very much reduced to a form consultant and someone else was the project leader taking care of you know, all the main decisions regarding structure, combination of uh, economy and the site and everything. Uh, and um, so I think we started more or less directly after school. So we had this more or less unproven idea or ideal of you know, just taking care of everything. So why not? And, um, and uh, so, so that's part of it. So then if that produced boring architecture, that's, uh, I mean, in a way it's, it's true, and perhaps that's also true in, in, in view of all the great architecture that was produced before, uh, with Leverance and Asplund and, you know, and, um, and well, some minor, uh, le less well-known internationally, I think, but still really interesting architects during the 50s and 60s. Mm. So, um, I, I think that we tend to make a bit of a joke of, about it, but it's, uh, it's also interesting because it's also created a platform that I think that we benefited from a lot because uh, there's a lot of standards and a lot of things that just work, uh, which is good when you, if you want to reconsider how you build or what, what part of the process you can influence as an architect. Mm -hmm. I think the, uh, the boring part is not that big, but, but when we started, uh, in the 90s, the architecture sort of um, became uninteresting in a way. And it was a, sh a shift um, during school, I think. Uh, a lot of new ideas came up during the early 90s that we were part of as students. And um, we felt that something new was going on. Um, the, um, the very simple reason why, why the architecture got boring during the 90s or 80s was that it was a big recession um, in the early, uh, or in the early, or eight, we had a couple of recessions, but, but in the 90s, early, uh, early 80s. And uh, almost a whole generation of architects got unemployed or didn't start offices. So the established offices were run by persons who were like in their 60s. And uh, no young offices and no offices uh, being in their 40s. So it was a huge gap. And when we started, it was a sort of lack of of new architecture, so we took that chance. Before we finish off, I'm curious about one more thing. And 
I mean, you're working in many different cities in Sweden and coming out of this, whatever it is, boringness, and now it's more exciting. So what is it, what would you kind of describe as the ten tendencies in the Swedish cities where you've been working and where is, where is the, the effort put to develop the cities or what are also the struggles? The, well, it's a very good question. I, someone compared what's happening in Sweden lately regarding city planning or urban planning to what's happened in some other parts of Europe. And well, the closest example is the Örestaden project in Copenhagen, which is uh, much more well known as a published urban plan, uh, but has produced very poor urban space. Um, or at least that's that's my view, uh, whereas there are many interesting projects in that urban situation. So if you look at the architecture, it's, it's, it's really uh, strong and it's uh, obviously that plan has sort of offered possibilities for um, private and public initiative to, to do something really strong, uh, but at the same time missing out on what creates a functioning part of a city, whereas in Sweden we've had a little bit of the opposite where um, there's been a lot of more or less conservative urban planning which has produced fairly well functioning new urban parts of the cities, but at the same time sort of totally minimized the, the possibilities or opportunities for architects to produce interesting work. Mm -hmm. um, so. Um, well, yeah, and, th and then we have not uh, worked specifically with that kind of production that often is linked to these projects, which is housing um, for the biggest companies. And as it happens, we have two or three of the biggest uh, construction companies in Sweden, which is a bit uh, a paradox since it's not one of the biggest countries. But Skanska, as you might know, might know here. Are, are they still in Britain? Yeah. Well, it's a Swedish firm. And uh, I, maybe that's why they don't care about that anymore, because <laughs> they're in the States and in the South America. If you compare it to, to Germany, for instance, uh, they have this big problem with those shrinking cities, uh, the sh kind of large cities that got abandoned, and the larger cities are growing. Uh, in Sweden, we don't ha really have that problem. We have this um, lack of uh, housing in the larger cities, and that's a sort of nice problem to deal with. Then you have to build something to solve the problem. It's a much harder thing to deal with if you have a lot of uh, structures that, that stands there abandoned. But that's um, probably a, a problem for, for the uh, more populated, uh, populated countries. Perhaps uh, I, we should also mention that we're, we're 14 people in the office today uh, and we've never been more. So. Um, what happened is that there's always a lot of projects parallel and we've been, when, when we did the Kalmar competition we were two persons and that's six years ago. So it's, it's uh, the focus in the office has never been to go for the big projects and you know creating a big um, firm and I think that also is interesting uh, in, in relation to the questions of what happened in Sweden or other parts. I, I know that there are Norwegian offices like Jensen and Skodwin that describes the situation in a bit the same way that it was extremely slow in the start which is also uh, an advantage in a way because you get a lot of time to consider or reconsider what you're doing and uh, to go into detail so that when you eventually get some a bigger project you've, uh, you've tried a lot of things uh, and you've had a lot of time to discuss within the office what what you're interested in. So um, um, that's also part of, of the context. Yeah, so that's for the towers in Stockholm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hey, thank you very much for a great lecture. <laughs> <laughs>